So I want to welcome everyone. I'm assuming you can hear me. Ben, is that okay? I want to welcome everyone to the NHMA College Health Scholars Program. This is our uh, recruitment conference, and we have a conference every year. We've actually had more than one in the past before COVID, uh, but since COVID, we've decided to go virtual. I want to thank the Lunch Pool Company for hosting us. I also want to thank all of our sponsors, the United States Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health for their special cooperative agreement, uh, and also our partners, uh, the uh, institute um, from uh, the institutes that are doing pre-health counseling, mentoring, recruitment in their own institutions. One is Great Minds in STEM. One is the New York Academy of Medicine. One is the Charles R. Drew University. Uh, and one is the University of the Incarnate Word from San Antonio. We have an advisory committee made up of the AAMC and the trade associations for all the different careers that we are working with, the dental schools, the nursing schools, public health schools. Uh, I mentioned AAMC, which is for the medical schools uh, and our graduate science partners. I also wanna thank all the speakers today and especially our staff Ben Milano and Vincent Garrity. So I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes about the importance of looking at three issues in your career journey as college students interested in going to graduate school in healthcare. There are three major issues that you all have to think about. One is your own professional or personal development. I grew up in a family of five in Pico Rivera, California, in Los Angeles area. Uh, my parents uh, you know, were hardworking. My dad was a factory worker, a machinist, and my mother uh, actually was a secretary for the uh, chief of police in Los Angeles and then quit when she had you know, one, two, three, four, five kids. Uh, but then she went back to college. Uh, she went to college, I should say, uh, as, uh, to study to become a nurse when I was in high school. And I was lucky to be able to get a job as a uh, messenger in the Beverly Hospital in Montebello, California. Uh, that was my junior, senior year of high school. And then I went to college. So your professional development changes when you get to college. You start having more relationships, more friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, significant others, but close relationships of people that are like-minded, you know, some, same, uh, same backgrounds, usually people you know, cling to, to wanting to, to feel comfortable uh, and have personal relationships that are positive and uplifting. And I would just say, think about you know, being away from those who pull you down. Uh, relationships are very important. That's what personal development is all about. It's also about time management and understanding your own profile, how much time it takes to, to learn something how much time it takes to, to feel comfortable and not anxious uh, so that you can study. Uh, anyway, that's the first thing. The second thing is your academic preparation. And no matter whether you wanna go to medical school, dental school, nursing, public health, or graduate science, uh, or other health careers, it's so important to understand what are the requirements. From day one as a freshman, I had to understand the requirements to go to medical school because that's what I wanted to do. I uh, decided I was going to major in a, in a major that would allow me to take the classes that are called pre-med requirements. There are pre-nursing requirements, pre-dental requirements, uh, et cetera. So I went to a college called Stanford University, which is a four-year institution. Some people, lots of my friends went to junior college or community college and then transferred but you have to know the requirements and you have to know the classes you have to take. The third thing is not only academic preparation, but you have to have a real interest um, in, in how you're going to continue financing your education. And that, you know, everything from loans and scholarships uh, is very, very important. So let me just say that one of my uh, and I'm not going to tell you about my financial aid. I mean, everybody's financial aid is based on your parents' income, is based on how much money you want to take out on a loan versus scholarships. 
uh, but you have to have an overall budget. And you're gonna hear about all this today. Uh, personal development from other students that are in medical school or dental school, uh, public health school, and you're gonna learn about uh, financial aid and you're gonna learn about academic preparation from the experts that we have today. But I just wanted to say one other thing, the National Hispanic Medical Association, which a bunch of us from California, Texas, New York, we started this organization in 1994 uh, and because I had worked at the, Clinton, at the White House with the Clinton administration. And it's just, a, uh, it's been a fantastic journey to see so many of our members who are at their senior level, junior level in their careers, uh, helping the next generation. I don't wanna say just mentoring or coaching, but providing information that they've learned along the way. And that's what our NHMA College Health Scholars Program continues. We are asking graduate students who are in medical school and public health school and nursing school and dental school to help us talk to you who are the college students, the next generation of pre-health students. And I just wanna let you know how important it is for you to start thinking of yourself as a future doctor, future dentist, what, whatever you wanna do, go for it. And I have to say that the uh, NHMA's College Health Scholars Program has a special website called, uh, well, it's on our website. It has a special page. The website is nhmamd.org. And if you go to our College Health Scholars Program, that is where you'll get information. We update it every month on new information for academics, professional and personal development, and financial aid. Um, the, uh, the, the last thing I'm gonna say is that it's so important for you to think about your own passion, no matter what you're doing. I know I had to be a pre-med and study a lot of chemistry and math and biology, but I ended up majoring in human biology that allowed me to have uh, courses that were something that I was passionate about. It was public administration. It was organizational theory. It was how do you develop your career to be able to have an impact through organizations and come to what I came to Washington DC as a, as a college kid wanting to learn, well, do I wanna work in Washington or do I wanna stay working in California? Uh, I obviously made the decision that I wanted to work in, Cal in Washington DC. <laughs> so I ended up working for the White House. I ended up working for the Department of Health and Human Services. And I ended up working for the National Hispanic Medical Association, where we are pulling in people to provide input now on COVID-19 and the vaccines distribution plan of the country and to help this White House, the Biden administration, understand how to better uh, develop their messages and programs for the Latino community. Because the goal of my career and the goal of NHMA has been to help improve the health of our communities, black, brown, Native American, Asian, all the poor people in the country to help our communities get healthier. And so anyway, I just, I'm gonna end with saying thank you again to everybody that's helped us. Uh, and and to please uh, put any questions and comments that you have in the chat function uh, we will answer them uh, throughout the day, or we will send you an email with answers, and it will help us with our frequently asked questions on our website. So please, we're here to help you, and please tell your friends to join the National Hispanic Medical Association's uh, College Health Scholars Program in our website, nhmamd.org. And also, we have a national conference coming up in March, uh, and like I said, we help each level of health professions, right, to get to the next level. Well, we have a very special poster session for graduate students to showcase their research and their service learning uh, so that they can put it on their resume and help build their careers. And also to get feedback from our doctors and dentists and nurses that come to our conference. So let me just stop there. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Uh, my name is Ben Milano. I'm director of programs here at NHMA and just wanted to welcome everyone um, today uh, for this virtual pre-health conference. 
Um, and I'm just here to kind of discuss a little bit on how to use Lunchpool. Um, right now, what you are seeing is just a superimposed um, of the presentations. And this is basically how all of our panels um, will be going through. Um, to your right hand side, uh, you will see the chat uh, function where people are already using it. Um, when we are uh, with our panelists and you have questions for our panelists after the presentations, um, you can go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A uh, session. Um, and we will uh, get started with our first panel, Opportunities in Health Cares, Health Careers Preparing While well in College for Medical and Dental School Programs. Um, after that, we'll have a quick break, um, followed by uh, two other panels, and then from there, we will. Uh, after those two panels, we will have um, a quick uh, recruitment and networking uh, fair. And for those who have signed up for the mock interviews as well as the one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, you should have received um, an email where you will be meeting the person um, on there. So uh, if you guys recall, um, when you were looking at this, um, the floor, there are tables on the side that, have, that seats two people. Um, if you are not in that table during that time for those networking sessions or those mock interviews and personal statement reviews, please do not sit at those tables during those times. Um, there are six floors uh, in the session. Um, and in the, right in the middle, uh, each table sits up to eight people. Um, and those are our recruiters uh, for today from two to four and then from 4.45 uh, to 6 p.m. Um, Dr. Uh, Rios will be uh, here during the recruitment fair as well. She will be in uh, floor six, table five. Um, so with that, uh, we would like to get started with our first panel. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Leonardo Suwani is the moderator. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer of Oshner Health and Associate Vice Chancellor of Academics at LSU Health Shreveport. Thank you very much, Dr. Suwani. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Rios. Uh, it truly is a pleasure to be here with you uh, and to take you through and give you some advice on how to become a physician or a dentist. Um, we have a really talented group and, and it's really a pleasure for me to introduce the two speakers today. And kind of what we'll, we'll do is we'll talk about holistic admissions and how med schools view admissions. Dr. Neal will take us through that and then talk a little bit about dental school admissions and what are dental schools looking for. And then we'll open it up, have a panel session for 15 minutes uh, for question and answers. Uh, just to say that, that as, as Ben said, I represent two medical schools that have two very different approaches to admissions. I represent the University of Queensland Oxford Medical School, which really looks at multi-mini interviews, your MCAT, and your GPA. And those are the three strongest components uh, in a rubric that decides how do people get into med school and how do we order them. And then the LSU side has a more holistic approach that has a more open-ended questions and interviews, uh, along with your MCAT GPA, focusing more on your science GPA. And I say that to, to point out that every med school has a little bit different approach that works for them about how they decide who will be successful in their program. And Dr. Neal will first take us through her approach and, her, uh, and how she's integrated holistic admissions to that. Let me just say, Dr. Neal is a professor of medical education and pedi pediatrics at West Virginia University School of Medicine in Morgantown, West Virginia. She's the Associate Dean for Admissions uh, for the MD program. And she's also the co-director of the Pediatric Residency Program and Rural Scholars Program in West Virginia. So she knows what it takes from what it takes to be a medical student all the way to what it takes to be a good resident and doctor. Welcome, Dr. Neal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Suwani. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be on the panel today. So I believe Eric's going to bring up my slides. Okay, so I will be talking about applying to medical school and what holistic review means. Next. And I also am gonna have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what, how my school does things. So the MD application process. So there's questions that you're going to need to really contemplate and have good answers to 
um, before you even start to apply to medical school. Next slide. And the first question you have to ask yourself and think about is, next, um, what's your ideal school? Certainly we're always worried about what the schools are looking for, but you really have to see where you would feel like th what that school is doing is what you want to do. Location, the mission of the school, other factors too. You also should ask, next, Um, do you have in-state schools to which you can apply to? Because those will have benefits definitely financially for you. And plus, you'll be closer maybe to your loved one's support, probably, if it's within the state where you live. Next. Does the school's website that you're looking at give you all the information you need? If not, next bullet. You can then see if next. You can then see medical school admissions re requirement resource that is put out by the double AMC will give you all the information you'll need. And if you don't have all of the information you need, you should feel comfortable to contact schools directly to have that information information solidified for you. So what is school taking all factors into consideration and then you figure out where you want to apply. Next. So you apply to medical school through the AMCAS process, through the double AMC, and I have the, what those letters stand for if you don't already know, and that explains how you apply to medical school. On the left of this slide, you see the different information that the schools are going to ask you about, name, address, and so forth, personal essays where students typically talk about their road to medical school, transcripts will be put there, the medical college admissions test, also known as the MCAT, what experiences you've had, and you have between, you have the ability to add in 15 different experiences, and you should really um, think about those experiences that are going to reflect your accomplishments, and when you know what a school's mission is, you gear those experiences towards what you, what the schools are looking for, and then letters of recommendation, ideally from someone who knows you well outside the classroom, in my opinion, so that they can Excuse me, can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah, so, okay, so then the next slide, next. So after that primary application, you will get sent a secondary application, which will be different for each school. And the secondary application, some schools may give every student that applies a secondary application. We do that at WVU because it does add to our holistic review because we have school specific questions. And here I am letting you know some of our secondary application questions. Why do you want to attend WVU? We have some students who've never been to West Virginia. They still may have great reasons want to go to school because they on that students who have ties to the state or the school are more likely to want to attend our school. How did the COVID pandemic affect your application? So you can list, well, this opportunity was canceled. You know, let us know what hardships you face. And you have the opportunity to explain on our secondary application clarify any deficits you have in your application. You know, why did you have difficulty with this class or what happened with that experience and so forth. Next. So I've mentioned holistic review. So what does it mean? I've given you some uh, couple of missions or what it means for holistic review that I took from the AAMC website. It's one that is based on really a school's mission and then a balanced Whoops, a balanced consideration of an individual's experiences and their attributes and their metrics. Metrics refer to their BCPA, you'll see BCPMA, which is biology, chemistry, physics, and math, and also um, your MCAT score. All four sections seem to have predictability at our school anyways. So I want you to think of the, of the, Holistic review as a balanced consideration of those three parts, your experiences, your attributes, which would be, slides can come back. Okay, uh, next slide. So the next slide shows 
Oh, okay. So I had mentioned that uh, you look at a school's mission. Here's the mission of West Virginia University School of Medicine. I'll let you so as I talk about this. So you can have some highlighted um, words in the mission, and then you can see how we can translate those into practical experiences that you can um, engage. Show the committee who's dedicated to our mission. They've already been involved in these types of activities. And it's easy to remember the kinds of activities that WVU School of Medicine looks for because the first four letters of each of those type of experiences of patient care, education, research, and service are the first four letters of the word person. And that's who we take care of as doctors, our person. So patient care, which would be shadowing, scribing, EMT, anything that involves you with patients so that we know you feel comfortable touching another human, uh, talking with them. Education and leadership, educators and leaders are who transforms lives. Have you been a teacher, a tutor, a TA, a coach, um, been on a team where you've actually been the captain? Research, I believe, is self-explanatory and service, um, giving back to others, volunteering your time. We do a good bit of that as physicians and, uh, you know, we, we want altruism and, you know, looking out for everyone and being in the military is a form of service also. Next. So those would be the kind of experiences we would look for at WVU. So if someone, so this is the balanced review that I talked about. Look at it this way. We could have a student that has a 4.0 average and they're very high up on this balance but if they have very few of the experiences that we look for at wvu it doesn't matter how great those metrics are they're not gonna they may not end up getting an interview so the e again stands for which would be mission based for each individual school attributes would be certain competencies we want you to have going into medical school and i'll see that on a couple slides later and some will be school specific like i said being a state resident having ties to the state of west virginia or a really strong that show you would fit our mission and then academics which is said the bcpm and the mcat here are some of the competencies that the aamc um, recommends that students have before they attend medical school. There are several others listed on the website, but I'm sure you, you should look with your pre-med advisor and those who know you best to go over these lists and think, how can I prove to the school that I'm competent in this area? So service, I believe, is self-explanatory. Teamwork, you can think of, of uh, times when you've been a good team player and your letters of recommendation can help reflect these competencies too, if not just in your experiences. There's many other competencies listed on the on AAMC. Next. So I'm gonna show you holistic review at work. This is exactly how we use holistic review at West Virginia University School of Medicine. So first point, step, have a subcommittee of our committee on admissions, which is made up of 35 to 40 members eight to 10 of those will be fourth year medical students who get training in how to review and what holistic review is, working on one's own biases and implicit biases and so forth. And a subcommittee of that group will first look at every applicant's experiences and then we'll rate those experiences, how mission-based they are for our school. And they will get, give a, get a color coding of green means to let's go ahead and interview this applicant because their experiences are outstanding versus as bad as being labeled red saying this person has experiences and other to do with our mission or very few experiences and then they'll they'll go to the next committee with that rating step two then next bullet a so the second step if i can guess um is where the the attributes and the metrics of the applicant are looked at and then and what we mean by that again attributes are they a state student is in state students do they have ties to the state are they bringing something else to the table for the school that's going to add to the richness of the educational environment such as being someone who fit one of our diversity categories 
um, which does, doesn't include underrepresented in medicine, which would be those who self-identify as, as being Hispanic or African-American, but also are they a veteran? Are they the first in their family to go to medical school or, or college? Um, are they in a lower socioeconomic status that maybe had some educational disadvantage growing up? All of that is taken into consideration, and, and those those um, specialized populations I just mentioned are, are listed in our diversity policy as to enrich our, in, as, as will in, enrich our educational environment. So that's an, an added. And then we at this stage of metrics. How is your a, your ECPM and your MCAT based on those attributes and metrics? Someone may get bumped up a level or two or get put down a level or two balanced on that EAM scale. So someone could come to us with a red experiences, do very well in the attributes and metrics category and could get moved up to be on a wait list for an interview, which is what we do, or outright interviewing, thinking maybe they can explain why their, their experiences are so low and so forth. So the, but if someone comes to us with outstanding experiences, they may have very worrisome metrics or some other or some other entity that's going to bump them down and then they get those who get invited for an interview get in, invited for an interview and um, then an interview is a whole other part of the process which I won't talk about in my presentation next so that's how it works at WVU next slide so I'll just tell you briefly about my school since I was offered the opportunity so WVU has been in existence to give out MD degrees since 1903. We also have MD PhD and an MD MBA program. There's also opportunities to do step outs for a translational research year, masters and so forth on a case by case basis. Next, we're one school, three campuses. We're located in West Virginia and I've highlighted there on the US map and then where our three campuses are located. We have uh, the main campus is in Morgantown, which is the middle star. The one that's more Eastern is very close to Washington, DC. It's in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and then in the state capital of Charleston. Next. At WVU, we strive very much so that everyone feels as if they belong. I was born and raised in and I came to Virginia in 1990 as a resident, my, a pediatrics resident. My husband is from West Virginia, we met in college together where we both went in Massachusetts, to college in Massachusetts. And so I've stayed all these years at WVU because of the people that I work with. Um, World-class physicians, many of them have come from all around the world and we have multiple organizations and events at WVU so that all feel included at WVU. So you can see some of the examples of organizations that we have. And if there are events, organizations, programs, or there are gaps that are not at WVU, our student services deans and student services and the dean and the president are very good at help filling those gaps along with students who bring them to our attention. Next slide. Finished medical school in three years at WVU at a special program called, Mountain, called Mountaineer Accelerated Track to Enter Pregnant, Enter Residency. And um, I, there's more information on that on the website and you can contact me personally about that. Next. We have a global health track, a rural health track, which has specific benefits that I can let you know about too on a more personal level if you come and visit our table. Next. We have a, our main recruiter and me will be at the table today too. We also have a, a, an interesting culinary and lifestyle medicine track, which is quite unique. And next, we have a residency rural scholars program. In fact, I'm one of the co um, rural scholar directors. Um, some of the benefits, for example, are that you um, get a 10th fellowship in your four school, you get assured a place in our residency program and uh, research benefit the lives of children everywhere. And you start that in fourth year of medical school and continue it through your three years of residency. Next, we have a world class simulation center, one of only three in the entire world, one of only 3% in the entire world. 
accredited in the four areas of assessment, research, teaching, and systems integration. And there are several hundred simulation centers in the world. Next. To summarize, um, you have to be, you have to thoughtfully answer those questions I posed at the beginning, the very first slides about what you want to get out of a medical school and look into those medical schools in more depth. Next. Uh, apply to, through schools through AMCAS and keep the mission, the competencies and holistic review in mind so that your application tells a story about who you are and what schools you would be best suited for. And hopefully you'll be applying to schools who you feel best suited for and want to be there. Next. You would complete the secondary applications from the schools and again, keeping the mission, competencies, and holistic review in mind. And you await your interview decision. And then lastly, you should definitely contact schools if you have more information. My last slide, I just have some contact information for me personally, a phone number where you can reach me. Um, Lauren Wamsley, who is our Director of Outreach and Recruitment, is doing some mock interviews this afternoon. We will both be at our table all day today. To I hope you come by and, and chat with us. Uh, we're very open to giving you one-on-one -on -one counseling even throughout the year and helping you as much as we can from the perspective of our school. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Neal. That was very, very good. Uh, uh, whirlwind tour in 15 minutes, uh, and, but we will have questions and answers. Um, has Dr. Berry arrived? So I do not see him on the screen. And if Dr. Berry has not arrived, perhaps we can uh, get Dr. Neal back on the screen and we can go into a uh, question and answer in a panel session. Just pause a second here. Uh, oh, there's Dr. Berry. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I was starting to break out in a little sweat right here, that, but that's, that's <laughs> the timing was perfect. Uh, so Dr. Berry is the admissions counselor for advanced specialty programs, uh, works at the Office of Admissions and Mon Minority and Student Affairs at the Herman Austral School of Dentistry at USC. So Dr. Berry, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. First, I want to thank NHMA, of course, uh, Ben Milano and Vincent Garrity for inviting me. Uh, we appreciate being here. Do I have my slides as well? Um, I'm not sure if it's Eric or can those be brought up? Thank you. So again, I'm, I'm Corey Berry. I, um, not only do I represent the DDS programs, but I also manage the international program, which is a two-year program for foreign trained dentists. That leads to a DDS degree, as well as our specialty programs, um, such as orthodontics, periodontics, <clears throat> pediatric dentistry. Um, those are all housed in our school. Uh, next slide, please. So today, I, um, I kind of thought about what I would talk about with you all. Um, and I want to give kind of real-world advice based on what I see our applicants go through when they apply, when they interview, when they're waiting for decisions. Um, so I will talk about the uh, ADSAS application itself. That's the centralized application where you do all of your application. Um, and I can't see, uh, I'm gonna have to rely on my notes. Um, let's see, your personal statement um, I'll also talk about how your application is reviewed. So I'm going to talk about our review process as a school, as a dental school. I'm going to talk about the dental school interview, what that consists of. We, uh, I think Ms. Rios mentioned the MMI. We do do that. So I'll talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to talk about the DAT or the dental admission test. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So the DDS application process, again, um, Ours is a centralized application, of course, and it's called ADSAS application. That is where you're going to apply to most schools in the United States. I should say most schools participate, but some schools don't. 
Um, but generally, all the schools that you're going to be interested in are going to be part of the ADSAS application. Um, so again, it is centralized. You're going to submit all of your information to that particular service. The application opens in June of each year, typically the beginning of June, and the deadline is always on, on or about February 1st of the following year. Um, December 1st is typically the date that our school and other schools across the country send out their first offers of admission. So that's going to be, you know, after you interview in the fall, that's when you're going to find out if you made the cut in the first uh, round of admissions. So that would be around December 1st. We also offer rolling admissions, which means we're going to continue to admit students throughout the year um, up until the school starts, which is in August. So if you apply and you interview and you don't hear something right away, you might hear from your friends, you know, that, oh, I got in, I got an offer. But just because you didn't get an offer in December doesn't mean you might not hear from us until March or you might hear from us in June. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see what to include in your application. Um, withdrawals, repeated courses, any D's and F's, of course, those are going to be calculated into your GPA. So you want to include those in your application because ADSAS is going to verify all that information. Um, any low grades um, that you received in any term, you want to explain. Um, we will give you, or ADSAS gives you an opportunity in the application to kind of tell us, you know, have you had any personal difficulties? Have you had any uh, mental health issues? Have you had any stressful situations? Did you have to work two jobs? There's so many different, you know, uh, experiences that our students and that our candidates have that kind of dictate, you know, they might have had a bad term. So if you've had a bad term, please, please explain. Um, next slide, please. So also what to include in your application, of course, ADSAS will ask you for your official transcripts for all the schools that you've attended. Um, uh, letters of recommendation, of course, are very important. I think someone mentioned that earlier. Um, we really heavily rely on re letters of recommendation. Um, what's required for our school are two science-based uh, letters of recommendation. So that means it has to be from a biochem or physics uh, instructor. Um, so it cannot be from a lab instructor. So that's one thing that you have to keep in mind about the letters of recommendation. Um, everything that, you in, that you're including in your application is being verified by ADSAS. Um, another thing that you want to do uh, as far as the letters of recommendation, many of you students have probably shadowed either a general dentist or perhaps a specialist. Uh, many of our students typically shadow orthodontists. I notice um, pediatric dentistry is very, very popular for shadowing and ortho. Um, so if you have made that um, one of your experiences, be sure to reach out to that dentist or those dentists to ask for a letter of recommendation because that can play a big role in our decision uh, when we're reviewing your application. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. Okay, your personal statement. That is probably a, a crucial part um, of our application review because it gets it, it allows us to get to know who you are as a person, as a student, um, as a healthcare provider. Um, so some of the things that we want to know are, you know, why dentistry? What, what are you passionate about? Why are you passionate about dentistry? Um, what have you done in dentistry or have you done any community service? Have you gone on any mission trips? Um, these are all things that you can and should talk about in your personal statement. And again, it's your journey, it's your own journey. So you wanna be true to who you are. Um, it doesn't, we don't want something that's mechanical. So when you're writing your personal statement, write it as if it's your, your own story. Um, don't write it as if it's a resume because we're gonna, you know, when we're reading your personal statement, we wanna kind of feel who you are. Um, we also look for team players. You wanna highlight, you know, what have you done as part of a team? Um, dentistry is, is a team-oriented profession, so you want to be sure to talk about, you know, what, what you like about working with other people. Um, are you empathetic? 
um, dentistry, just as well as medicine, being a doctor, you, you have to be empathetic towards your patients and towards your coworkers, towards your fellow dentists. Um, so be sure to include these types of things in your personal statement. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the previous speaker, uh, Dr. Neal, I believe, um, also spoke about the holistic review process. Um, we, we also do hol an, a holistic review of your application. Um, the one thing that we do look for is upward trends. Um, again, some of you may have had bad terms where you may have had a low GPA, um, but in that case, we look at everything else. We look at where you've shadowed. We look at what you've done in the community. Um, we look at whether you're doing an advanced degree. Some of our students go on to do a post back program. Um, some students do a master's program. Um, so those are some of the things that we, we will look for. So even if you're below the minimum GPA um, that we're looking for, there's always that possibility. So keep trying, um, make an appointment with our admission staff. That's always an important thing to do because you wanna be sure to ask questions and come to the source. Don't just get the answers from, you know, uh, studentdoctor.net. Um, you wanna to come to the source. So again, uh, researching the schools, researching, you know, what we're looking for, not just what you're looking for, because you're interviewing us as well. So those are, that's, that's part of the holistic review. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the other important thing, of course, we don't um, require the MCAT like medical schools do, but we require the dental admissions test or what's also known as the DAT. So it includes all your sciences. Um, uh, the, the main important thing to know about this is that our minimum score is 15 across the board. If you get anything below a 15 in any section, we will not consider your application for that year. So you would want to retake the DAT, if you, if you score below a 15 on any section, even if it's just one section. So you wanna keep that in mind and take the DAT only when you're prepared. That would be my biggest advice as far as when to take it. So once you've taken all, all of your prerequisites, uh, that would be the time that you wanna take the DAT. Um, next slide, please. Uh, scholarship opportunities, I wanted to go over this just very briefly. Um, again, these slides are going to be shared from, from my understanding, um, so you can get all this information as far as different websites to look at, um, but we have merit-based and need-based scholarships. If and when you're uh, accepted to the program, you're automatically considered for scholarships. So we will, uh, sometime in the summer of your acceptance, our ass assistant dean of admissions, she will reach out to you and let you know if you have been awarded a, a scholarship. But scholarships are plenty, especially for underrepresented minorities. So that I just wanted to give you a tidbit of information on. Um, next slide, please. Uh, group, everybody wants to know, you know, what am I going to expect for an interview? Um, someone mentioned earlier that MMI is part of their interview process. Um, the first part of our interview is called PBL, problem-based learning. It's basically a case uh, scenario situation where you're put into a group of six to eight students in your interview. Um, you, as a group, we're going to give you a, a sample or a, a virtual patient. Uh, this virtual patient is going to have a problem and you all are going to solve this problem together as we, the faculty and or staff, are just sitting and observing you. So because we want to see what your teamwork skills are, we want to see what your critical thinking skills are. We want to see that you come with ideas. Um, we want to see that you're innovative, that you're not afraid to share. So that's one part of the interview and it's called PBL, problem-based learning. And then also we have MMI, which is also known as multi-mini interviews. And that's basically a situation in which you're given a scenario. Um, you have two minutes to think about that scenario um, and then once you think about that scenario, you're, you're taken into a room with a faculty member and a staff member, and then you kind of talk about that and you're given six minutes to discuss that scenario. So that's another way we get to know you as a person, no matter how good you are on paper, no matter how high your GPA is, we want to look to see who you are as a person. So those are the, our, our styles of interview. And I think I have a couple, one more slide. Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, Learner-centered education basically uses a variety of instructional tools and learning methods such as problem-based learning, which I just discussed, um, case-based learning, you're gonna do pre-clinic, you're gonna be able to practice on a mannequin, um, you get lectures. Um, so aside from PBL, you know, uh, you're also gonna get lectures. Um, you're gonna get clinical rotations throughout all of our specialties that I mentioned in our school, um, community service, and then also research. Um, so you're going to have a lot of opportunity to, to get that hands-on experience that you're going to need before you go into a clinic or into our clinic and start treating patients. And I think that should be the last slide. And I think we're right at that time. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you, uh, um, Corey. Appreciate that. If I know we started late and we are kind of right at that time, but we do want to do some questions and answers with the panel. If we can get Dr. Neal back into the panel will take us through some questions. So one question I saw pop up on the chat box is, how did COVID affect our, uh, your interview and your admissions process with my schools? For the Oxford UQ school, we went to a virtual MMI. So we did all of our MMI interviews, still stationed, but all virtual. At LSU, it's an open-ended interview. Uh, we also went virtual with the interview with a virtual campus tour and open-ended questions. And, so uh, maybe Corey, you'll go first and then Dr. Neal. It's just a question is, the question is, Corey, how did, how did uh, COVID affect your interview process and how do you- Oh, okay, gotcha. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah COVID, COVID made a huge impact, I think not just on us, but on all schools. So yeah, we typically do that in person because we wanna have that person-to-person -person contact. So all of our, interviews um, were virtual this year. Um, we had an interview on a Sunday, basically where you kind of uh, talk about your experiences through the MMI, um, just camera to yourself. Um, so it was just you and the camera. And then as far as the PBL, we had those uh, group interviews as well virtually. So everything was just totally different. It worked out perfectly. It actually, it worked out better than we, what we thought it did. So it was, it was very successful. We converted, oh, we converted to all virtual interviews also, and they did go way more smoothly than we anticipated. I think that we didn't change our interview style. Our style is really, I call it innocuous, as in we just want to see what the applicant is like and help, and they can describe their experiences and, and those types of things. I think we're going to see the biggest effect on the applicants, I would say, in the next couple of years because of like freshmen and sophomores now aren't getting experiences that they normally would have had. So we went to all virtual. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Um, one of, the, one of the questions that I get asked, I didn't see it in the chat box, but I get asked very commonly is if, what undergraduate course has the best predictive uh, uh, capacity on, on how you will perform in medical school? So Corey, I'll put it for dental school for you. What undergraduate course do you think a pre-med or pre-dental student should really emphasize because you found it's really predictive of how they will do in dental school? Well, you know, there's not one that I could say, but I think the best way for me to answer that based on our experience is to say that we um, look for all different majors, number one. So we have cinematic arts majors, we have business majors, um, engineering. I mean, so we want um, students that are very uh, well organized, number one and kind of have different experiences. So um, fine arts, I mean, you know, cause I think within dentistry, empathy is very important. So we look for empathetic people, empathetic students. So I think those types of courses, especially in the cinematic arts, I think uh, translates well into our program. You would never think that, but um, we get all kinds of majors. So I think that's a big lesson. A lot of students ask us, well, do I have to be a science major? You know, no, we, I think it could be any major. Um, but if you have that heart and you have that empathy, um, that would make you a successful dentist. That's great. Dr. Neal? I would say biochemistry for year one, but curriculums are changing at schools. 
we're focusing big students in their clinical experiences earlier. Like third year is getting moved up earlier. But for the first year, I would say biochemistry. And I would say those students who have never had anatomy at all, they have a tough time with anatomy, but it's so variable uh, on students. And just Dr. Berry said, certainly, yeah, we encourage all types of majors, but I would say to answer your question about the, you know, what a concrete course for that first year anyways, biochemistry and anatomy is helpful. So, and, and Dr. Neal and I did not coordinate, but I will tell you, we did an analysis at both of our med schools looking at best predictive, like Dr. Neal said, for their first and second year performance was biochemistry. And biochemistry now is a big part of the MCAT. So that's always what I tell students, is make sure you've got a really good, strong handle on biochemistry, even if it requires a summer, an extra summer school course. Um, the other thing that I find is very helpful, and it really is in the future of, of, of the practice of medicine, is your statistical skills and your be, being able to uh, uh, understand big data and numbers. Uh, and so a biomedical uh, uh, course on, on stats or biomedical informatics is very, very helpful later on when you get to your clinical and your residency and you start looking at the practice of medicine. Um, let's see if there's any other questions that come through. Uh, is there any way to contact you? I think that this organization, will, will, NHMA, will figure out a way. Um, well, look, with that, I will, because uh, we are five minutes over, I'll leave final words uh, for Corey, final words for Neil, and then I'll leave you with some final words. Corey, final words or advice, I should say. Yeah, just, um, you know, come in confident, um, ready. Um, I think the, the best thing for students to do who are in that range of, you know, deciding on going to dental school is to research the programs. Um, doing your research first uh, and foremost is the most important thing so that you're prepared when you're applying and you're not just applying to random schools. You're, you're going to apply to where you really fit in or where you really want to go. Um, it's not just applying to 30 schools just because people say you should apply to 30 schools. You should apply to schools that actually you could see yourself at and that you match as far as their requirements because you're not, you might not meet their requirements. Um, so it's, it's very important to research, research, research the schools. Um, that I think as I've seen a little bit um, of a hindrance for students in the past. Dr. Neal? I would say keep up your studies. Um, don't underestimate any part of the process. And also choose experiences that you definitely will get something out of too, not just to check. Because when you write about them, when you, when you talk about them on your interviews, it'll show through your enthusiasm and how you're going to fit the mission of the school that you're interviewing at. And that's a big, big, big deal for committee members to see. Thank you. And, and I'll just be very careful of the after effects. So I'm a first generation immigrant, first one to graduate college from my family. And I remember going through pre-med and wondering, hey, am, am I good enough to go to the med school? And, and, and those negative thoughts are easy to sink in. Uh, and so if medicine or dental school is your passion and you are committed, we're looking for Hispanics. We want Hispanics in our medical school. I mean, we actively seek them out. Uh, you can do it. It's a lot of hard work if you have the, but be very careful of the imposter uh, 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 effect. You, you got what it takes and there's no reason you can't be a doctor or can't be a dentist. With that, I want to thank the panel. Great job. Uh, and I appreciate everybody joining us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you awesome. Thank you, Dr. Sawani, Dr. Neil, and uh, Mr. Berry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, but I do want to give uh, the students a little bit of break to just a quick bathroom break. Um, so I'll go ahead. We'll come back around um, 108, 109. Um, but for now, we'll go ahead and um, stop the presentation and let some students kind of go through and switch tables. I um, mean, we'll come back around um, 108 to 109. Thank you very much. <laughs>